Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, folks, thanks very much. It's be raining outside. You don't normally get this many people at the tradition meeting. So, so welcome. It's usually like announcing a fire when you say traditions. Boom. Yeah. So I'm really glad to see you. I'm Tom, you're an alcoholic, a member of the primary purpose group in Southern Pines, North Carolina. And uh, not an expert on tradition. I'm a lover of traditions. And I'm a believer in traditions and their vitality to us individually and as a fellowship. A uh, long time ago, when I was in jail and the whole world it looked bleak and dim and dark, a tradition, believe it or not, was one of the first things that gave me real vision that Alcoholics Anonymous was not just a gaggle of drunks in a basement somewhere, that it actually was a spiritual movement that could and has reached entirely around the world. And so that was a great thing. I guess that's one reason I always had a real particular feel for that. I'm not going to read anything out of the book. I just kind of like to have it to hold on to, you know, just <laughs> security blanket. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to do it in a, in a rushing urge. I'm going to get right at it. That uh, normally... I'm not sure how much time I've got, but you can tell when it's over because Lee is going to stand up and give a gentle signal, and if that doesn't work, he's going to roar <laughs> something awful. And so I'll know it's quitting time. Uh, I like to look at traditions, in, in, particularly from a personal standpoint, rather than just the institutional standpoint. And I do that, uh, not a, well, one reason, because they do have vitality, every one of them in my life. But it also makes it a lot easier to understand. If you try to understand it organizationally, it gets to be a little hairy. It gets to be a little complex. But the same principles that, that are viable to keep our fellowship in good condition also apply in my life. Not a single tradition that doesn't apply to me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically take off on the personal aspect first and then extend it to, uh, institutional stuff as we go. Now, that's an ambitious kind of a <clears throat> agenda. I want to read, I want to read one thing that Bill wrote. That'd give me credibility. <laughs> <laughs> Bill wrote a thing that said the 12 points of tradition are little else than a specific application of the spirit of the 12 steps. Recovery, uh, 12 steps of recovery to our group life and to our relations with society in general. The 12 steps would make each, each of us, I wonder why I couldn't see that. <laughs> God, I thought it was Bill's writing. It was just my vision. <laughs> oh, what's wrong with that boy? He got <laughs> <laughs> the steps would make each individual a member, a whole, and one with God. The twelve points of tradition would make us one with each other and whole with the world around us. And well said. That well said. Bill had a way with words. And uh, let me just kind of take on that thing. So I'm just going to take off on the on traditions. We I wish to God we could be interactive because I. I really believe in the value of interaction. If we, uh, I tell you, if there's something that you really want to ask about or comment about, stick your hand up. And the only thing I would ask is to put it in one line or don't make a speech. Right? Let me do that. But, <laughs> but just make it in long, long, one line or format because what I'll do is repeat it and so it'll get on the recording. Nothing more maddening than a recording that has answers to no questions. And so it's meaningless. Uh, so if it's something you'd really like to just sort of stop and visit with, feel free to do that. And I'll try to be alert. If I don't notice, you holler. First one is about 
A common welfare. A common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon a, a unity. You know, I believe that uh, the first tradition is, is is much like the first step. What kind of tradition, really? Got to earn your money here. <laughs> it's, it's much like the first step. That first step is is the is the element elementary fund uh, foundation of the program of recovery. And in that sense, it's the building block for all of the steps. They all point back to that first one. And, and the first tradition, same thing. Our common welfare is first. To me, is the most fundamental thing there. And every other tradition sort of goes further with how to, with how, in fact, to, to, to maintain that. Thanks very much, Al. Um, and in my life, you know, I, I like to look at it in, in, from that standpoint. I'm not quite as generous as Bill, though. Our common welfare comes first. But when I look at it personally, I like to say my welfare comes first. And I really believe that. And I really mean it. Now, I'm a nice guy. And I'm pretty generous. But I'm not like an old buddy of mine. He used to be a boy. An old boy, he'd be, uh, been dead for a long time now. But he used to say when he was speaking, and he spoke around quite a lot, if, now it was rhetorical, I know, but he would say, if one of us, meaning me or you, the group, if one of us has to drink again, I hope it's me rather than you. Now, don't get your hopes up. I am not that nice a guy. <laughs> None of us have to. But if somebody has to, I will hope I am the last soldier standing. Now, that's just how generous I am. My welfare comes first. Personal survival depends on that. And, but, but my welfare is tremendously dependent on taking care of the boat I float, which is called the Primary Purpose Group in Southern Pines, North Carolina. It's also called the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so if I want my welfare to be in good shape, I've got to have a group that is, is in healthy condition so that I can really put my faith in that group is a place to get my life together. And so my home group is not some place I attend. That's some place I belong. I'm a member of that group. I belong to that group. I'm as much a part of it here this afternoon as I am when I'm in the meeting there. I belong to it. It's as much a part of who I am as my, almost as my personality, as my fingerprints. It's, it's a part of who I am. So I'm a member there. I belong. I'm a part of a team. I'm a part of a group that's gathered for a purpose. And so if I believe that, then I've got to take care of that. You know, I've got to look after the welfare of that group. And I'll give you one example on that. And, and i got so doggone many examples. I don't have time to talk about tradition. i just talk about examples. But I learn more from examples than I do philosophy. I could, I'll give you an example. Now, I am a guy that puts a lot of importance on his own group. I'm a good member. And um, I was out of town a while back. Lee, don't send any of this in North Carolina. But I, I was out of town, and a business meeting occurred while I was gone. Now, I know that my loving brothers and sisters would not have timed anything to do while I was gone because they knew I would adamantly oppose it. Now, I know they wouldn't do that. But it would have been a handy thing to think about. <laughs> and they would have been right. <laughs> and uh, so while I was gone, we had a business meeting. I wasn't there, but that meant I was there. And I was for everything that happened because I wasn't there. So I'm there. So while I was gone, we made a decision. You know, our group breaks up into to several different meetings on Monday night when we do our content type stuff, you know, rather than speaking meetings. And uh, the group voted to eliminate what I believe was a fundamental part of the integrity of that group or what made that group work. To eliminate the big, we have one group that's built around the book. And uh, to eliminate that in order to reinforce the other means. Well, to say that I was angry when I got back, would have been the most euphemistic statement of the century. I, I was mad. I mean, I was flat mad. Now, when I'm mad, I get a little goofy. 
I mean, I am not sensible and logical. And I was mad. I mean, I was flat mad. I was too mad to do anything about it. If the common welfare is truly important to me. If it's not, and the only thing that matters is me imposing my my uh, thoughts, then it wouldn't matter. I have to think about the fact that I'm the oldest guy around in my area. And because of that, there's a responsibility that goes with that. Not just as a member, but as a senior member. Somebody that people look to as a leader, as a, what do we call it, a, what do you call a guy, not a bleeding deacon, but elder, elder statesman. No, not elder, just statesman. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. I had to muzzle it because I was too mad to say anything. Now that was hard for me to do. Sat in the first business meeting, debated long and hard. Didn't say anything. I was still too mad. I did, it wasn't inventory. I don't like to overuse that word. But I basically really challenged myself to, to reckon with, are you just really mad? Are you just angry because somebody did something that was an insult to you or, or you felt like was disloyal or something? Or do you really care and believe that that's fundamental to your mission in that group? And I, I went through that. Second business meeting, I was still too mad. Third one, I was ready. <laughs> and by then, I knew without any question whatsoever that I, honest to God, felt what I believed, uh, I, I was angry about that. I really believed what, what I was angry about. And that I never said a word to anybody. Talked to the sponsor on the phone. But I didn't talk to a single soul. And when uh, time came, I'd already resolved that if we couldn't resolve it, I would have to leave. I would have to leave my home group that I found. Because I simply won't be a part of a limping little thing that just doesn't have a comprehensive program. I'm just not going to do that. Now, I never said a word. So when the time came right at the end of the business meeting, I uh, had, just, had just a few minutes left, and I said, I said, I don't want to make a motion. I just want to make a request. And I uh, said a couple of months ago, whatever it was, we uh, had a business meeting and we decided to fix something that wasn't broken. And we discontinued the big book thing. And I want to make a request that we reinstate that effective tonight. Well, there was naturally a stunned silence, you know. And one guy muttered some, no, no protest, just muttered some question about something. We voted, it was unanimous. You see the point? I hope the point is that if I look after that welfare, I'm not going to be looking after my way. You know, that if that's conscious of that group, then fine, that's the way it was. But going at it in a way that genuinely tried to make it have the integrity, that was very important. Now, that's what common welfare means. It doesn't mean to impose my will on that group. It means to try to look after the welfare. So that not only me, but the next alcoholic comes in that door will have a good shot at getting sober. Very important kind of a kind of a deal in in looking at that common welfare. It's uh, I used most of the time on one. Well, I said it was fundamental, so I guess that, that bears that out. I want to say a couple other things about the uh, about that and expand a little bit on the, the personal thing about you know. Now I'm somebody who uses tradition. I don't just talk about. It. I use, in fact, I think I consciously use traditions more than I do steps. Steps are a way of life. I don't have to work steps or say, I think I'll do an aid on this. Yeah, I don't have to do that. I mean, steps are, it's like it says in that before, these are a set of principles. They practice a way of life, you know, they do their work. And so that's what I do. You know, I do instinctively live by the principles of steps. More consciously with traditions. That I'll use them. And I use them, I use them in my family. I use them in my business life. I went through a professional career and I guarantee you that AA traditions had more real value to me than anything I learned in college, university, management training, or anywhere else. Because they're about team building, about getting unity, about people working together, how to get something done. You know, and, and so I use them in everything that I do. Uh, 
I'll give you one example of the thing with the, the family. The, uh, now, my family are familiar with tradition. I, I, they're not little AA clones, you know, robots or some, but they know what they are. <laughs> and we have been through some sessions. We do them every once in a while. We had a thing a while back. Like, I know there's a couple other families in America that do this. We got sort of lost our perspective about Christmas. And we thought the way to prove that we loved each other was to give each other a bunch of expensive stuff. I got st- I got ties that I've had for 30 years that I wouldn't wear to a dog fight. I, got, <laughs> I mean, come on, Jesus. The kids grew up with toys that they'd throw them away in boxes never open, for God's sake. Well, I just thought that was goofy. But in the interest of peace, I didn't say anything for 30 years. I said something like that. It seemed like 30 years anyway. And then finally one day, there were only four of us. You know, we had a group conscious. We uh, came together, and I said, look, let's talk about something here. And, and, it's, and it, it said, you know, this is a first tradition type of thing. Well, it's the welfare of our family. I thought I was the only guy in our family that didn't like that. But when we got it out in the open, I thought my wife was the drill sergeant for it. I, I thought she was the one that absolutely mandated that to happen. I found out she hated it worse than I did. <laughs> well, not worse, but it's bad. The kids hated it. So here we are caught up in that, in that great American ethic that if I get you a bigger something, it means I love you more. Baloney. Baloney. <laughs> and so we made a decision, group decision, we're not going to do that anymore. Set a $50 max on any gift we're going to give somebody. And then we decided rather than having a spending orgy on ourselves, we would find a family that wouldn't, <coughs> excuse me, that wouldn't have a Christmas <coughs> unless somebody stepped in and helped. And so that's what we've done for the last several years. Every year we get a family we don't know. We know where to find them. And, uh, Last year had a, a Mexican family. This fellow had, I can see why he had a lot of kids, because he didn't have a job, and he had to have something to do. <laughs> and he uh, was very productive. He had eight kids. And uh, I didn't even, I didn't, that's, that's dumb me. I didn't even think about him. But we were talking about the family, and my son, who is an overpaid physician, he said, uh, how about Miguel? And I said, my God, boy. I knew if you talked long enough, you'd finally make sense. That, that's, that's a great deal. And so we just gave Miguel a bunch of money and a, and a family of Christmas. You know what I'm talking about? You know, the common welfare. You know, that it's better served when we get to thinking about something that's going to have usefulness and ownership within a family and not just some kind of a, a, a fox kind of a thing. Uh, just a, a whole bunch of other stuff goes in that. that um, uh, I just mentioned one other thing that uh, my common welfare not only includes all of us, it includes the next person walking in the door. They're part of it. Whether they know it or not, they're part of it. They'll know it pretty quick. And when they come in, I, I honest to God, want that person to get as good as I would give it. How could I justify anything less? And And so... That's part of it. You know, how well do we receive the people? How well do we get help incorporate people into the group, give them a good shot at recovery? So all of that to me goes in the, into that, the common welfare thing. And it truly is. I'll give one other, one other example, then I'm going to move on to, to another one and beat it to death. Um, when I was, when I was working for a living, I'm unemployed now. It's a pitiful, pitiful case that uh, y'all might want to take up a love offering before I get out of here. <laughs> No, no, I'm kidding. I, I'm living on a fixed income, but it's fixed pretty good. <laughs> uh, when I was working, I was a statewide administrator of some stuff, and I went into a, to, to a facility one day, and you know it was a setup. I mean, you could smell a rat pretty far away. And when I walked in, the, the director of that operation came over and he said, "Boss, wanted to ask you how you would how you would do something." He didn't ask me what you want me to do. Got to listen to the question. He said, I want to ask you how, how you would do something. That meant he wanted to compare what he'd already done with what I would do. And so he didn't know how much to tell me, I guess is what he was asking. But anyway, I, I heard what he was saying. And so he told me the situation. It was a pretty, t- pretty delicate situation. 
And I pondered it for oh, at least two minutes. And what I thought about was common welfare. That's all it was. It was a place where there were two people involved in a situation. One of them was going to get hurt. So you got to look at what's best for most. And so in two minutes, I told him. I never did ask him what he did. Because he didn't ask me for help on that. He wanted to know what I thought. And so the common welfare makes a complicated, tangled situation difficult. Uh, I, I said I was going to tell one more, but I'm going to add one more to that. Because Al's going to give me a little bit of extra time anyway, he said. Lee Wall. Uh, I had lunch a while back with a genuine rocket scientist. I mean, that's, he's one that really does that stuff. Uh, I don't think he's going to ride it up there, but he's going to send it up there. As I had lunch with him, and I was fascinated with his lunch conversation, because he's telling me all about the space technology and all the stuff, most of which I, I couldn't even spell space, much less understand it. So he's telling me all this stuff, and I'm listening enthralled at what he's talking about. And then you know there's a point in the conversation where somebody will look at you. That means it's your time to respond, you know. So I'm sitting there saying, duh. <laughs> and uh, then a, a thought occurred to me. I said, have you ever thought about using AA traditions? He was in the program. I said, have you ever thought about using AA traditions in what you're talking about? And I swear to God, he looked like I'd hit him. He just stunned. You know, he said, AA tradition." I said, yeah. I said, I'm serious because what I've just been listening to you describe a fascinating process and it's clear that you guys know how to shoot a rocket off somewhere and get it where you're pointing. You know how to do that. Technology is not your problem. Man, you know how to do that stuff. Where you're lost is trying to get people to work together as a team and not kill each other. Technology is not the problem. It's the same old human deal of how to get human beings to gather together and pull together. And the rocket scientist said, when he got over his shock, said, you know, I'm going to go home and take a look at that. Why not? I, we've changed email addresses. I'll see if he does it. If he doesn't, he keep on fighting. Uh, it's his business. So, anyway, that was, so that's enough on the foundation. Not enough, but I'll quit anyway. Second one is about, it's really about leadership, where it says each group, each group has but one primary purpose. For our prior group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, excuse me, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants, they do not govern. Our group purpose, but one ultimate purpose. What is our group purpose? It's stated well in the fifth tradition that every group has but one primary purpose. That's all. This meeting here today has but one primary purpose. This entire roundup has but one primary purpose. The international convention, wherever we meet, the only purpose we meet, if we're, if we're doing an AA function, is to carry this message to the alcoholic who still suffers. That's what we're about. What we're about. And so for that purpose, there's but one ultimate authority. And that, and that's that nobody has got the right way to carry the message. Nobody tells me how to do tradition. Nobody tells you how to conduct a meeting. Nobody tells you how to do a 12-step call. There's no authority for that. Each of us has got to do that in tune with our own spiritual makeup. And it's got to be our journey. And so we don't organize that for our, for our group purposes, but one of the authority. And uh, in, in the, the deal I gave you about my home group is, uh, is one where we had to get the group conscious to come to bear. And uh, it, I keep losing my place. As the, uh, our group is one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. Al, I'm counting on you, but I forgot the glasses again. Uh, that has to do a lot with leadership. You know, that, that part of it is the purpose part of it, but leadership. Let me give you an example of that. So if you get serious about traditions, I guarantee you, you'll get tested. You will flat get tested. 
And you'll either stand up or crumble, one or the other. That's not an antagonistic kind of, a, kind of thing, but it's just a thing. If you mean it, you've got to stand up for it. Otherwise, you don't mean it. And that, I'll tell you how that came to, to fruition for me. When, when I first got a joint, I was, I was in, a, in a city down in our state actually starting Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, they, they, there was one guy standing in that town when I got there. There were two, but one moved away. And there was one old man that, uh, he was older than me, I swear to God. That boy was on the shady side of whatever he was. And, uh, but a wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. Dear friend. He loved me as, as much as if I was his own son. The old guy used to call, he would come by and, and, and drive me to meetings every meeting night we had. He would always just come by. And it was a wonderful experience, wonderful relationship. Well, when we started putting a group together, <laughs> There had been a little bit of a ragged kind of a deal going on. He'd be meeting once in a while. And this guy was the treasurer in perpetuity. I mean, <laughs> rotation meant when he died, uh, is what that meant. <laughs> and uh, so, so he'd been a treasurer forever. And when we started getting a little group going, you know, alcoholics are sensitive now. Now, we're sensitive enough. Alanons are just a hair more sensitive than we are. And when we started shaping up as a group, we started, you know, if you stay in a position too long, you establish squatter's rights, and you own the position, and you get territorial and possessive about it. Well, started getting some complaints. Somebody would buy a bag of cookies. And they'd go over to him, this guy's name was Mac, wasn't his name, but we'll call him Mac. He said, Mac, the cookies were 99 cents. And he'd say, my, my, cookies sure are getting expensive. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, folks, <laughs> that'll hurt their feelings, you know. So he hear these rumblings in there. What's that crotchety old dude doing? Well, it was, it was obvious <laughs> that the time had come for rotation. Now, bear in mind, he and I are like Siamese twins. I love him like a father. He loved me like a, <coughs> like a son. And then, so we started to have our first genuine election in the history of AA in that town. And uh, now everybody knew. I mean, nobody was out of the loop. Everybody understood that there was some stuff that was getting ready. We were trying to develop a group. And so when the elections came up, chairman was a no-brainer. Man, we had that thing done, typical AA style, about 10 seconds, and we had a chairman. Secretary, same deal. Treasurer, that was the quietest AA room I have ever heard in my life. And I sat there thinking, oh, God, no. Anybody but me. I mean, anybody. I mean, somebody he didn't like could have nominated somebody, he'd have laughed. If I nominated, it was going to be like a dagger, you know. So I'm sitting there, sweating bullets, saying, for God's sake, somebody make a move. Well, I'm somebody. <laughs> and I tell you, that's one of the toughest things, <coughs> excuse me, one of the toughest things I've ever had to stand up and do in an A group. Oh, there's, that's, that's hurt in that. There's hurt. And I'm confident he had no understanding of, of, of either. He didn't know about rotation. He never studied that stuff. And all he knew was that he was getting something taken away from him that was important. And um, tough job, eh? But if you mean it, if you really think common welfare does come first, if you think the welfare of the group does come first, then sometimes you've got to take that lonely stand. So I did. I mean, I'd have given anything not to be the one standing there, but I was. And I either had to crumble or stand if I believed it. So I did. I wish I could tell you that it was okay, and he shrugged it off and said, oh, well, it doesn't matter. It did matter. It did matter. He was never the same. Uh, I mean, he and I remained good friends, because <laughs> we did <coughs> have a genuine friendship. But he was never the same. You know, his spirit was gone. He went through the mechanics of, of, of participation, but something was taken away that was important to him in his identity. I didn't like that. But when I left that town uh, two years after I got there, not just because of me, but because a group came together, we had 60 members in that group. 
So sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. There's no easy way around it. And so traditions are not like little pledge to the flag, you know, that, geez, I'm going to be loyal and long-suffering and all that. You know, sometimes if you, you've got to take a stand and do what's right. And that's what traditions are about, is to give that guidance you know, so that we can do those things. Third one is probably the most hashed and rehashed one in, in, in all of AA, about uh, same as purpose. Now, I want to read the... Uh, I think probably one of the worst rewrites we ever did in our life was writing the short form of the third tradition. The, the short form, 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 the short, short one is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's so simple. I mean, my God, you can be a pit bull, Joe, if you want to. The only requirement for eight members is the desire to stop drinking. Okay, good. My golden retriever has that desire. The long form has got a little different message to it. Now, here's here the difference in this. Our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. Hence, we may refuse none who wish to recover. Nor ought a, a membership ever depend upon money or conformity. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group, provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. Now that's a much more clear statement of the purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous than you'll find most other places. But at the same time, it's as generous as could be. Conformity is not required. You know, I'm you know, I'm up here without flying the flag today. Some people think that if you behind a podium, the flag is is obligatory. I don't. If you put work in front of it, then I want to dress for work. <laughs> Tonight I'll get uncomfortable. No, tomorrow night I'll get uncomfortable because I'm you know standing up as a representative of recovery. So I, that'd be a little different standard. Here I want to roll my sleeves up and grunt and sweat a little. So different deal. But that's not required. Conformity is not required. Sometimes we belittle people with a hat on back. I don't know. Maybe they got neck trouble. I don't know why folks wear it. It's their business. It's their problem. And uh, so conformity is not a requirement. And uh, so I'm free to free to be a member. That uh, and the, the definition of group. If you could be more generous, I swear to God, it's beyond my imagination. Two or more alcoholics gathered together for the purpose of recovery. Call themselves an AA group. I don't care who they are. As long as they're not, they don't have another affiliation. If somebody wants to go out and sit on those motorcycles that, that uh, parked illegally, they start a group called <laughs> Down with the Establishment or something, they can do that. <laughs> if you want to have a, a, a counter roundup rally out there, <laughs> There, there's freedom to that. You know, that it, it, we can form a group and it doesn't have some some description of the box it has to fit in. Two or more alcoholics gathered for the purpose of recovery. Very generous kind of thing. Couldn't be more more generous, I don't think. The trouble is in that, you know, what's happened over the years, there's always, ever since I've been around, there's always been a... a it, since I've been here anyway, there wasn't too much. I got here in 57. and uh, But then there was a little bit of sort of low-key turbulence owing to this. N.A. had just come into being. Uh, there were some two guys from A.A. just got frustrated that it didn't meet their needs, and they started something called Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, I came in about two years later. And we had, a, back then it was mostly horse junkies and prescription meds that were the real problem. And um, we had some of that. And what we noticed was that when winos are talking, horse junkies nod out and vice versa. And so we heard about NA and said, maybe we can help guys get that started. So some of us from AA, like I took everything known to man, but I'm not a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic who loved long parties. I love long parties. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I'm not a drug addict. I'm a drunk, you know, I'm just a garbage can appetite. And, uh, but we said maybe we could help start. So we helped start a, a group of Narcotics Anonymous in the state of Michigan in 1958. Still meets. 
still meets. Compare that to this sort of patronizing thing of saying, oh, just come on in and hang out with us. Big difference. Big difference. If you want to help, you may need to dig a little deeper and just come in and act like us. That's good enough for you. Well, it's not. I think that's a very patronizing kind of a deal. And so it's been a little bit of a deal. I, I tell you, there, there are a lot of places in this country. I travel a lot. And there are a lot of places in this country, unfortunately, that have totally given up on this issue. I mean, they don't even pretend to sing as a purpose. Wouldn't know what it was to hurt it. That, that's troubling to me. That is troubling. I tell you what my position is, and I hope you've got yours staked out or, or that you will. Here's what my belief. In 1935, 30, well, late 34 and 35, the formation of AA started to occur. And then when Bill went over to see Bob in the gatehouse, you remember that, that momentous meeting where the 15 minutes turned into five hours and 15 minutes. And something happened that day that I think was momentous. I think something happened that day that forged the basic tenet of Alcoholics Anonymous. The fundamental tenet of Alcoholics Anonymous. When they got through talking, or at least took a break, the physician said to the, to, to, to the rundown stockbroker, finally somebody understands. First time somebody's talked to me about this condition that I could understand. Fundamental, basic, that the physician heard it from another alcoholic. And what happened that day, the basic tenet that was formed was that when one alcoholic opens up and shares his life with another alcoholic, it creates a bond of trust and understanding second to none. And that's the basic tenets. That's why our purpose is always the same. It's not to carry the message to every wounded soldier around here. It's to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. It's also a good way to kind of keep us properly downsized that we do one thing better than the world has ever seen. And that's all. That's all. Doesn't make us experts in finance, marriage, sociology, or any, anything else. Basic tenet. Now, I believe that. T- tell you what brought that service to me for a way. I, I sponsor a group in a prison. And uh, over there one night, had an election. And the chair that was conducting the election, it was going to be one of those typical AA deals, he needed a cha- chair. So they opened up, somebody nominated a guy that I knew. And he happened to be the chairman of the Narcotics Anonymous group who was visiting the A group. And they started to vote. Now, sponsor does not mean visitor. Doesn't mean that. Sponsor means guide. Sponsor means leader. Sponsor means a guy who's going to try to demonstrate how it works. So I'm, I'm a sponsor, not a visitor. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, God. Now I hate you to do that. Well, that guy, Mike, he was a nice fellow. He was a nice fellow. And I knew what I was going to do was going to be embarrassing to him. But I'm not going to sit there and watch an AA service function go down the two. And so I said, Mike can't be elected. He's not a member of AA. He's a good guy, but he's not a member of AA. And so they went on and elected somebody. And, and uh, after the meeting, the chair said, said, Tom, you know, a lot of guys in here are really confused about that whole thing you're talking about when we were talking about electing Mike. said, would you expand on that a little bit? Well, sometimes when you're caught short, you just have to resort to the truth. You know, and, <laughs> and the book's a little, a little kinder. It says we will intuitively know how to handle situations. <laughs> that means you've got to tell the truth, man. You have to get the wall. And, uh, so they, I said, and I didn't have time to make up anything fancy. So I just told what I thought. I, and I said basically what I just said to you. That, that and the first time I, th- I think I'd ever done that in a group. And, but it just intuitively came out. And I said, you know, that's either true or it's not. If it's, if it's not true, then it doesn't matter. 
It doesn't make any difference. My God, we can be anything anonymous if that's not true. But I believe it's true. And if it's true, I think that every one of us, every one of you who are in AA and me have an absolute responsibility, if we believe that, to do everything we can to assure that the next alcoholic man, woman, boy, or girl who walks in that door is given that environment. Anything else is an abdication of responsibility. So if we believe it, I think it's very, very important. I know this is a fantasy, but but my whole notion is we need a worldwide group conscience on this thing. I know it's not going to happen. But (laughs) it happened in my group. (laughs) And it can happen in a lot of other places. But it's a huge problem. If that premise is right, nobody has ever successfully even made me have doubts about that. I'm I'm open-minded, I think. But not much. Enough to hear. But I think a tremendous issue. And not one that we can just say, oh, well, that's the way it is. Yeah. But, sure. I don't want to, but you can. But the question was, can you be a member of both, of course? Yeah, we don't have rules and regulations here. I know a lot of people. A lot of people come in, and I don't like to be just just hardline, period. You know, I like to have better alternatives, you know, not just, just, just sort of hardline stuff. The, um, I know a lot of people, particularly people who come out of a treatment facility, they're used to multi-diagnosis. I mean, my God, it's understandable that a, that a treatment center is not going to have a guitar for every person. I mean, they got to have their own thing. I, I wouldn't have said guitar, I wasn't in Nashville. But I've <laughs> got a little something for the home team. They, <laughs> but, yeah, and I understand that. And so when people come out of treatment, they're simply, a lot of time they're multi-labeled. And, and it takes a while. And with people coming in like that, I, I like to be patient, personally. I like to be patient. And, and any kind, of, you know, the last thing somebody needs is confrontation. That's the last thing. And I think and that's the crudest, most ineffective way to deal with the problem. So I think with people like that, you know, that you've got to take, take a little patience, and most of the time what will happen when people come out of treatment, they're very often addict, then they become alcoholic addict, and then the addict disappears, and then become AA members. You know. But that's sort of an evolutionary process, developmental process. And so, yeah, a lot of people belong, belong to both, and, and there's nothing wrong. Most people, I always encourage them to find your home. Do what you got to do. Find the place where you fit. And if you don't fit, man, you can't force it. And so that's what I try to do. There's somebody right back here. No, let me let me let me stop you there and tell you what we're about. It's about how do you deal with it when you're outside your own nest. You know, if you're in a if you're in another place, you're in somebody else's group. How do you deal with it when it's anything but a, a, a straight line AA group? And what do you do? My answer to short one is nothing. Nothing. So the last thing you need in a group is some visitor coming in and telling you what to do who doesn't even know when day what days you meet on. So it's really not, it's, it's, it's not that anybody's going to faint if you do. It's just they're not going to pay attention. You, you, you got to have some credibility and just having right information. You got to understand the problem first before you respond. Then you got credibility. So the best thing, now I do a lot of stuff like we're doing here. And, and, and brother, when the word gets around, you know, if you do stuff on traditions, home group, singing is the purpose, word gets around. And they'll keep you busy. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that made the short answer to me is not to do anything. And if privately, if you got some, so this under leadership, you have a coffee with them, you know, I'll do that sometime. Let's talk, you know, how you dealing with this thing? I, I, I'll tell you to, just two other quick things about this one that is kind of in line with what, what we're saying that, yeah, you know, I think the worst thing you can possibly do is publicly confront it. Because any time you publicly confront it, you're going to have a winner and a loser, and often two losers. That's what's going to happen. And so when you come in and you get somebody with some loud, raucous saying, you're in the wrong place, you got to go somewhere else. That's a horrible way to deal with it. You can do better than that, for God's sakes. When somebody comes here in the wrong place, I think at a minimum, they need to have a warm welcome and guidance to the right place. 
The last thing we need to do is turn the, the AA into some Jerry Springer show. With a, uh, that, that's not that's not the way to deal with that. If you want, <laughs> now is that for me or Jerry? <laughs> Let me mention one other thing in that line while I'm at it. Now I tell you, it won't break my heart if we don't get through. I'll just come back about ten more years. I'll come back and we'll pick up. I'd rather deal with a few thoroughly than to rush through and see you up in 21 days. Uh, but let me add one other thing in terms of responding to it. And I think there's a big difference between reacting and responding. And uh, a couple of examples. We had, I was in a group. Everywhere I've been for the last 30 years, I was in a group that I started because it's hard, just like you're talking about, it's hard to find good sound three legacy groups. You better be, be a good searcher if you do. And, and so I, I started a group, and it was a pretty darn good group. One, one, one night a guy came to me. He, he was a New York guy. kind of surprised me. He said, Tom, we need to do a group inventory. Now, that's an unusual kind of a comment. And I said, why is that? He said, oh, we've got too many drug, act, drug addicts in here. Now, I, I get busy, and I, and I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I Sometimes I just don't catch on quick. And I said, well, let me take a look and see what it, well, what it was. Somebody had one of these little capturing places for juvenile, you know, for young youngsters. And uh, they had them herded up over there. And so they would load them up on a van and bring them out to community deal. And that's what they think we are. And so <laughs> here they, they, they were coming over there. And that's fine. We, and we... Often we are our own worst enemies. Most of our wounds are self-imposed. And, and what was happening, I, I watched it, saw what it was. In in our zeal to make the kids feel welcome, people were involving them in, in the meeting and asking them to, to get up and read how it works or something. And uh, so it was us. And so we talked about that, decided we needed to do something. One, we needed to go over and talk with the director of the facility. And they asked me if I would do that, and I said, okay, I'll do it. So I went over and it was a nice young uh, MSW, a, 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 a lady, nice lady. And so I talked with her about the problem, and she had never heard of an open or closed meeting. Where would she hear of it? They don't teach that in MSW programs or anywhere else. If we want people to know that, we have to tell them that. We're the ones that know. Yeah, we have a function in AA called CPC, Cooperation with the Professional Community. And that's what that means, is to find the folks and find out how we can cooperate. How can we help them meet their needs with those youngsters and not screw up our group? And we resolved it. We resolved it by starting a newcomers group as an open meeting. And uh, part of the agenda, that the primary agenda was to help folks get introduced to a good introduction to eggs. But a secondary agenda was to deal with people who didn't know what they were. And those youngsters didn't know whether they were sheep or goat or, or whatever. <laughs> they had no clue. And so it was a good neutral ground to just sort of talk about and get resolution, eh? And uh, in the group I'm in now, we just celebrated our 11th year. And we, uh, you, can, we, you can bet we've got a newcomer group. I, I don't think I'll ever be involved in another group without a newcomer group. It is an absolutely magnificent resource and we want it to meet at the same time as our main meetings. Otherwise, it, it defeats the purpose in terms of dealing with the single purpose thing. So we want it to be at the same time. We're starting one next Wednesday night at prison, I sponsor, a, a newcomer group, for the same basic kind of resolution. So it's, it's at the point of that is if you're troubled about this whole issue and how to deal with it. Yeah, I mentioned that as example. It's a lot better to respond to it and, and meet the need than to just sit back and try to beat somebody into submission or something like that. Yeah, you know, we can do better. We can do a lot better. And, and so that's a whole part of that sort of, sort of yeah. The question is whether we've accepted as drug is a drug is a drug over the years. We haven't. Polite society has. We have not. And, uh, well, I say we. I can't speak for everybody in AA. I guarantee you I don't. You know, certainly drugs have a lot of common, denom common denominators involved with them. 
But the fact is, you go back to that thing that was talking about with Bill and Bob. I don't care what the chemist says. What the experience says is that when one alcoholic talks to another alcoholic, something happens. I couldn't care less about the science of it. You know, I have some out of curiosity, but I don't bring it up in my business meeting. You know, so, yeah, I, I think there's a popular notion about that. There's a popular notion about a lot of stuff. And, and very frankly, I, I think a lot of those problems are un, under the umbrella of what I was just talking about. You talk about something like CPC, Cooperative Professional Community, you'd be amazed how many people in this fellowship don't even know what you're talking about. Have no clue. I guarantee people sitting here today right now, they say, what is he talking about? I was doing a session out in Colorado at a convention. I was in the audience and I asked a question just like you're doing. And uh, a lady spoke up afterward and she said, could I ask a question of the questioner? <laughs> and I said, is it all right? Tom, I said, yeah, sure. She said, I've been in AA 22 years and I'm embarrassed to say it, but I don't know what CPC is. What is it? And I said, honey, don't you be embarrassed because you're probably speaking on behalf of about three quarters of our fellowship. We've quit doing that so long. It's almost, almost like that little thing in the ear, this evolution, evolution to take care of it. We, we've almost stopped doing that kind of stuff. Active outreach programs, you know, where we really try to get relationship with people and that kind of thing. We've just almost quit. And we're reaping the product of that. That very candidly, I, I believe, it's just my belief, there'd be different ones in this room, but, but I believe that we're enjoying the lowest level of respect in the professional community that I've ever seen right now. And it's not because they don't like us, it's because they don't know us. And they don't know us because we haven't reached out. Yeah. And so I, I think those kind of, those wounds are pretty much self-imposed. And so I, I think that's why I think it's so important to respond to these kind of things and try to, try to introduce something better. Yeah. Like what? In, oh, in a, oh, okay. <clears throat> I don't give a lot of advice, I give experience. The, uh, the, uh, I'm not overly sympathetic to not being any in a in a town, you know, that there wasn't any in that prison either, so we started one as a good neighbor, not as members. Yeah, yeah okay. So there's a result. Yeah. The, uh, I, well, I'll give you an example. I, I, I sponsor a young physician. Well, he's sort of young. He's young compared to Al here, but he, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> I, you know, I noticed him. He was a, he was an interesting fella, and uh, I noticed that there was some kind of troubling about it. And and I noticed like a lot of people who go through treatment, like we're talking about, he had some, and particularly with folk in a medical world. Good God, if they don't get involved with some kind of, 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 of narcotic involvement, it, it's, it'd be a, a remarkable. And so, I, and what I was troubling with me was that he would he would put stuff. Always about drug in there. Now that's okay if it's in the right perspective. But one day I was flying somewhere, and, and I like to drink that tomato juice on the plane. Yes. I looked at the can; it said 100% tomato juice, and I said, "That's a lie. That is a flat lie. That is not one." And I know better. I never made a tomato juice in my life, but I know better than that. And. uh <laughs> You couldn't, it'd be cost nine dollars a can if it's pure tomato juice. So I looked at the bottom of it, the number one ingredient is, guess what? You better believe it. You better believe it. Now what was troubling, every time this guy talked about drugs, you always list your main ingredient first. So every time he's talking about drugs, he would list that first. That's what was troubling to me. Didn't know it until I read it on his tomato can. So the next night, the next time I met with him, I said, I want to talk to you about tomato cans. And, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> I did. Exactly what I used. And, 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 and when he got through, he said, you know, I never thought about that. He said, I didn't know I talked that much about drugs. I said, it's not so much what you talk about, it's how you phrase it. And you're listening to your story and immediately you start driving a wedge between you and the other members. You're stating your difference and then trying to catch it up. And, uh, and so he, you know, he caught on. Now, somebody had to tell him that. And, uh, 
So, but, but I, I think it's a, it's a tremendously difficult issue, but it's well worth doing. Well worth doing, I think. And that thing of doing the uh, a newcomer meeting, believe me, that, that's the finest thing that I've been involved in for a lot of years. It's been 30 years that, that at least that, that we've been doing that. We've had two unpleasant incidents in both of those groups in 30 years, both of them caused by one of our members. Somebody that just didn't know how to talk with people without being condescending and abrasive. But none, it turns out, anyway. But there's resolution there. Let me mention, yeah, go ahead. I do too. Yeah, he's asking about uh, examples about this indicators of loss of respect. That same, same doctor that I was telling you about now, he, he told me about an incident he's up at the hospital, at one of the regional hospitals. Said he was walking down the hall, saw one of his colleagues, and said, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm in AA now. And if you run into any patients that have uh, uh, alcoholism, feel free to give me a call and we'll, we'll, we'll give you some help with it. And he said, geez, Bob, I really appreciate that, but I found a better resource. And uh, they didn't pursue what that was. But see, that's what's happened in our absence, is that people do develop other resources. And, uh, you know, for many years it was readily available treatment and all that kind of stuff, but we simply haven't developed those kind of relationships. There are, there are remarkable examples someplace. There's remarkable places where you do see it. My home group, I, I, we, we're not the group in century. We're just a small group in a small town, but we are an active bunch. Every service entity in Alcoholics Anonymous exists in my group as an organized function and they handle that area of service. So we don't have to look for where to go to get service. You know, I'm talking about detox, rehab, hospital, prisons, you name it. CPCPI. I'll tell you, there's one other doc I sponsored that. Is that over this? There's one other doc. I don't want to beat on docs too much. But this one is a, he's a, he was a real space cadet, this one. He's an anesthesiologist. And, uh, <laughs> Well, thanks very much. Uh, he, <laughs> I told him I thought he got himself confused a little bit too much with the patient in that anesthesiology, and, and I think he did. He came in our group. He was in, in the group I'm in now. He was our first CPCPI chair, and uh, he really is a loose cannon. We, uh, he got a. We, one of the first things he took off on was doing a radio program. And I said, that's fine, just get some members, go over there and interview them for 10 minutes or whatever. I didn't ask him who he was getting. So about six months later, I thought, I said, how's that program going? Oh, super, man. Well, my God, he was taking people over with two weeks sobriety. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Man, I believe in getting them involved, but let them get sober first, for God's sake. <laughs> but he was just exuberant. You know? uh, he came to me one day, I, I won't tell too many on him, but came to me one day, and uh, he said, said, Tom, can we do a television program in the group? I said, no, you, I mean, you, we can't do that. What's the matter with you? And he said, well, now he was one of those community docs, you know, that comes on local cable, talks about ingrown toenails or something. <laughs> but he was, he was one of those. And uh, he said, no, I don't mean broadcast the media. He said, what I see us doing is getting puts four of us up behind a table with our back to the camera, or their back to the camera. And I'll do my regular doc thing. From the, from the, I'll be looking at their face. camera will be looking at their back. I said, my God, boy, I knew if you talked long enough, you would finally make sense. That makes sense. And he did a great job. In fact, he's doing five weeks of that. If you're in Richmond, I warn you, you may not want to go home. Uh, he's doing five weeks of that starting this week in Richmond, Virginia. He's living up there now. So, you know, th th those kinds of things are what we quit. But that's just one indication uh, of people who, I I I'll just mention one other one that, uh, you know, when I retired from corrections, after the day I retired, the guys had already elected me to be chairman of the, of the AA service committee in, in North Carolina. The, the, the area chair. And uh, so I took it. And, and when I, I took a look, now it wasn't all startling news. I'd been there and I was kind of aware of what was going on. But I, I was fairly well aware that what had happened over the years 
that nobody disliked AA, particularly. They disregarded it. You know what I mean? It, it was just seen as sort of a quasi-religious, recreational, harmless activity that did little good but no harm. That's pretty much the way it was seen. It was handled by people at the very bottom of the food chain. The lowest level staff. Those who had about as much authority as, as those of us coming from AA. They were the ones handling the program. And so the level of respect had drifted right to the bottom. And upper management or leadership didn't know or care. So when I took that job, I made an appointment with the, with the director of prisons. And I went in and told him exactly that. Said exactly what, what I just said. That what, what's happened. That we have, you know, I, what I really want to do is get that level of respect back where it belongs. To treat this as a major problem. It's the biggest problem in the system, for God's sakes. Why are you going to get that get to the bottom of the food chain? And so he was open. And, uh, and so we went to work. And, and today, uh, it's a matter of policy in North Carolina that upper management has a, has a role in this. Uh, we just introduced to Virginia that they do too. That that young doc I'm talking about just got through med, mud wrestling with his first warden. And so far he's doing okay. He's doing, he hadn't been locked up yet. <laughs> so, but it's that kind of stuff. You know, where that's what happens. If you don't feed it, if you don't nurture the relationship, it'll die. It's like a romance. You know, it'll die if you don't nourish it. And, and so that's what's happened with us, that we just have a call on people. Like that social worker who's running in a place with troubled kids with, with alcohol and drug problems. Had never heard of an overclothed meal. You know, nobody bothered to tell. And so I, I think that's what it is. It's not some change of society with the, with the callous disregard. It's just that we have just sort of pulled our horns in. And uh, I'll I tell you one other thing. I won't have time to get much further with this, but... Um, I got North Carolina's time, which is highly confusing. I don't have to worry. I got two timekeepers. I, I'll give you one other example of the thing where I, I think it makes a point. I, I was out in California a while back doing a doing a workshop with some guys, and uh, actually doing a retreat. I think we did a part of it as a workshop. And there were well, these were some pretty nice folks from up in the Bay Area, and there were a group of, of young slicksters from Hollywood that came in. And they were, I mean, they were no big deal, but they were just some young, young folks that were looking for a good time. You know, they just wanted to go have some fun. And so they came in here, and here was this old bunch of deacons sitting in there. And so they wanted to kind of, kind of, you know, stir it up a little bit. So they started asking some kind of off-the-wall questions. Y'all asked good questions. They, they asked some real off-the-wall stuff and wanted to get us stuff. And I, I, I didn't just jump on them, but every time they tried something, they hit a stone wall. <laughs> And pretty quick they found out that I'm knocking on the wrong door. And then they got serious. And these three guys from Hollywood. And they said, well, let, let me tell you something we talked about on the way up here that we really concerned about. We don't know what to do. He said, it's this, and everybody here knows what we're talking about. It's this sort of, sort of revolving door treatment with celebrities. That, that's in every scandal sheet, every television day. And he said... It's, she said, she said, it's a travesty because people can't even get to a meeting you know, without cameras for them and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, so I said, well, you know, fully understand the problem. You understand the dilemma. I said, but let me ask you a question. How long do you, and you think about the same question in your town. I don't care whether it's Nashville or, or wherever. Think about this in your town. I said to them, how long do you think it's been since somebody in Hollywood has gone to the editor of the paper, for example, and talked about the criticality of anonymity in early recovery. Of course, they drew a blank. And you might draw a blank. But it's just another example. In journalism school, they don't teach anonymity. <laughs> they have a quandary. They deal with an ethical dilemma because they've got a public right to know to deal with. And then here's something else. It's a human thing. Or do you want to sacrifice somebody's chance at a new life? So, it, it, and that's a place where we can be helpful in that kind of thing. Because they don't know that. 
And so I, I think it's just an example of, of, of the kind of stuff that they're not angry with us. They don't know us. Good. good. Yeah, good. I hate to admit it, but I subscribe to the same magazine. Now. I'm not as old as you, but I... <laughs> That's great. That's great. I wrote a letter to the uh, to the newspaper in Raleigh just a while back. There was one of those tragic things happened. A, 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 a young woman was killed at leaving an AA meeting by another member. And these were new people that sometimes happened. They got met on the AA campus, and he beat her head in with a rock. Well, it was a horrendous crime. Any, any kind of crime like this, really. <laughs> but this was especially notorious. And it was very well articulated that they'd just come from an AA meeting. They'd met at an AA meeting. So you see the picture. Now, what do you do? You know, I mean, I could have, I could have written to the uh, protest to that, but what they did was get to dealt with the public's right to know. A week later, uh, one of the writers wrote a very sensitive article, not rebutting any of that, but expanding in a very sensitive way, the way a case like that should be handled. I wrote a public commendation to him. See, rather than jumping on the editor, you know, I wrote a commendation <coughs> for doing the right thing. And so I, I think if we just give some thinking to this kind of thing and, and just work toward that cooperation, that, that that's what it's about. What I found is that most people readily welcome us. Readily welcome us. And... Um, because they don't know. They're at a loss. And we just simply haven't bothered them. They get a letter. Editors, for example, get a letter from the General Service Office once a year. You might as well send a Mickey Mouse color. You know, people don't respond to that. You think of how much junk that you get every day <laughs> and how much you listen on television. You think somebody's going to read that and say, oh, geez, yeah, this one. No, it's a good effort. But it's a token effort. What matters is when human beings sit down across the table and say, here's the problem, here's the solution, can we work together? I've never had anybody turn it down. Nobody. And uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's what it is. We're reaping what we haven't sown. You one other example. In, in, six, in 60, and I wasn't there now, but in 60 at the International Convention, <laughs> the stage was filled with non-alcoholic friends of AA. Filled with Sister Ignatia and Charlie Silkworth, all, all of these people, all of our great friends on that stage. The last one, maybe half a dozen. You know, we just simply, in and out of the fellowship, we, we just haven't done much of it in that area. And so, but it's just one of many, my God. And, and so, if I had time to do the other <laughs> traditions, it would be, uh, be uh, getting into that kind of stuff a little more. It, 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 we act for the time. Me? Ten? Ten. Time to Twelve, thirteen. Pull the hook, please. All right, let me go. Let, let me just deal real quick with a couple others that may not directly uh, deal with that. But one I just want to tell you about anyway. Uh, one... And I've seen about here that I'll, I'll, I'll just jump ahead and borrow the bottom line of one from one of the later predictions. The, the meeting here this weekend is coupled with, not joined with, but with simultaneously having that barbershop quartet convention. The, uh, I guarantee you, those folks know who we are. We're going to do some public information work, good or bad, good or bad. Parking in the fire lane is not one of the ways to communicate good information. So I just point that out because we don't need to walk around uncomfortable, but we need to be aware. When we're talking about a spiritual program and you walk by a table and it sounds like pool room chatter, it's not a real good deal. And so I think I point that out just to be mindful. That public, you know, that the, the, the public attraction is based on us, not letters from the office or billboards. It's what people see in us. I'll give you one quick example on that thing. I'll, I'll just shorten it. I, I was meeting with a bunch of guys in a hotel lobby one time, and we we're getting ready to put on a service uh, workshop, service panel, and we were just doing a regular deal. 
And uh, there was a gray-haired couple at the next table. I, I noticed them, but it was not doing anything. I just kind of casually noticed it there. They got up, went over to check out. When they came back, stopped at the table. And the, the woman was the more forward of the two. She said, she said, excuse me. She said, we didn't, we didn't mean to, uh, to listen in on you guys, but, but we did eavesdrop a little. And, uh, said, we, we couldn't figure out what you're doing. And I said, oh, okay, that's all right. She said, well, what are you doing? <laughs> I was chairing the meeting, so she read I said, we were planning a meeting. We're going to be doing a panel workshop this afternoon, and we were planning the meeting. And she said, oh, what's it about? I said, it's about service. And she said, in relation to what? <laughs> well, I, mean, I wasn't particularly playing cat and mouse with her, but I, mean, I didn't want to just force, force it on her anyway because she's observing our behavior in a group. And uh, I said, it's about Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> she said, and her husband spoke up a couple of times when he got a chance, that he didn't get a chance to say much. <laughs> and she said, and they said, well, we were just talking about it. And she said, we agreed that you were the most intensively focused group of people we've ever seen. <clears throat> Is that priceless or what? Can you imagine that? Thank God we weren't just telling raunchy jokes out in public, thinking nobody pays attention. Thank God we weren't doing that. Thank God our concern about the message that we convey was a little deeper than that. But I guarantee you that 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 couple would have sent their grandchildren to alcoholics, <laughs> alcoholics anonymous <laughs> without hesitation. They'd have sent the Pope, for God's sakes. I mean, but they, I mean, but the same thing here. I mean, we don't have to walk on eggshells. We just be ourselves, but be mindful that there are a lot of people here keenly aware of what we're doing. I'd like for them to leave here with respect. I don't, for respect. I don't know exactly what it is, but they're pretty doggone good folks. It'd be a good day's work. The last, <laughs> last time I was in a convention where they had a barber short shop quartet convention going on. I got to the airport, I saw these three guys over there, nice looking fellas with, uh, these with tags on. I said, there's my boy. So I went over there and they greeted me. <laughs> and so we said howdy and all that stuff. When I, I noticed they looked a little cleaner and stiffer than, than I'm used to. And, uh, and I was in South Dakota, for God's sake. I mean, they supposed to have on jeans and cowboy hats. And so got out there and the warden looked at me and he said, you are here for the National Barbershop Quartet Convention. I said, no, man, you, you a few years late for me in singing. I, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Thought about that when it came up here. Uh, so, anyway, that, uh, that's uh, the, the last thing I just wanted to take a quick shot at is, is the fourth one, which is about uh, uh, autonomy. And it, it really ties in a little bit with what I'm saying there, that autonomy is a very important thing. And, and it means that each of us is free but with that freedom goes responsibility. Very serious responsibility. And the thing I, I thought about this afternoon when I, was, when, I was, when I was getting ready to come down here and I was thinking about this, I thought about something happened in this state a few years back. I was, I was at a conference here at somewhere, not in Nashville, but another town. And the fellow who spoke Saturday night was, uh, I'd never seen him before or since. I, 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 but he was, he, I, he, I don't know what, he, was, he, he thought he was supposed to be a comedian. And he wasn't funny. I, I mean, the guy was not funny. And you know how it is when you're going down the tube. The more you sink, the harder you paddle, you know. And so he's just trying desperately to pull out one. And everything he told him just flat. And the uh, further he got, the worse he got. And he got profane and vulgar and obscene. I'm sitting there with my wife. I don't appreciate hearing it myself. My wife doesn't listen at home. I don't want to bring her to Tennessee unless some clown introduces that kind of junk. And uh, I, I didn't like it a bit. But I liked it a whole lot compared to the guy right in front of me. I was <laughs> I was watching the woman, poor soul, who had a range of speakers, including him, was sitting right in front of me and the guy sitting beside her. <laughs> I tell you, it was fascinating to watch his neck. You know, it just... <laughs> It just looked like a thermometer. It just kept getting red, and his ears were, were glowing. And uh, I said, uh-oh, uh-oh. And, uh, 
After the meeting, I caught her and I said, uh, your friend didn't seem to totally enjoy the meeting tonight. <laughs> and she said, she said, Tom, you'll never know, man. I have never been more embarrassed and humiliated in my life. That was her minister at his first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll guarantee you he was at his last meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hear what I said about that gray-haired couple? He wouldn't have sent the worst drunk he had to Alcoholics Anonymous. He'd sent him to hell before he'd sent him to AA. What a disservice, eh? What a disservice. Somebody just gets casual and doesn't think how important what we convey is. For God's sakes, we're dealing with a killer illness. We're not dealing with just a little bit of social nuisance behavior. People's lives depend on it. <clears throat> so anyway, that's what happens, you know, with autonomy. With autonomy comes freedom that I can be any kind of member that I want to be. Any kind. I can practice any way, any way I want to. As long as I don't interfere with your right to do the same. When I interfere with your right to do the same, I'm abusing the privilege. And so traditions, they can be a lot of fun. They're where I got a lot of vision. They're, they're where uh, an, an awful lot of weight and dependence falls. I give you one little homework question if, if to take with you and think about it if you will. Traditions were introduced in 1950 at the first what we call international convention. They weren't put in place, but they were introduced to the delegates at that convention. Five years later in St. Louis, they were adopted, along with the time, that was the time when Bill Wilson, who at that time was the leader of Alcoholics Anonymous, and Bill in 55 turned the fellowship over to, the, to, to his membership with the traditions as the principles to guide. Twelve years, about ten, seven years later, the uh, concept we're written to, to lay out the, you know, the, the structure for our, our, our work. But these traditions were put in place. The trust that went with that is that we would take these principles and take care of the fellowship that was in our hands. It's still in our hands. So all of the stuff we've talked about is a part of the answer. When you get home tonight, ask yourself how well we've done. What have we done with what Bill gave us? I'll check with you next time I'm here see what happens. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.